So the camera. Good afternoon, everyone. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, thank you. So thank you so much for coming. It's a beautiful Friday evening uh, with some warmth. So it's uh it's appreciated that you're here with us today. Uh, my name is Ernesto Castañeda. I'm the director of the Center for Latin American and Latino Studies, as well as the director of the Immigration Lab and the Masters in Sociology, Research and Policy, Research and Practice. Sorry. If I have any questions about that, talk to me uh, after the event. Uh, I'm also the co-PI, along with Lauren Carruth, uh, who is here and her class. Thank you. Uh, Joe Young and Susanna Campbell of the uh, Changing Aid which is a strategic research initiative supported by the office of Diana Burley, a PhD, uh, who is the Vice Provost of Research and Innovation. Uh, the talk today is also part of the C uh, SIS Changing Series, uh, Changing Aid Series, supported by the Dean of the School of International Service, uh, Shannon Hatter. And uh, we thank them, as well as uh, Nicole Hassan's staff, uh, Kay Somers uh, from SIS, and Grace Benson and Madison Shoemaker uh, for, uh, from Changing Aid for taking care of the logistics uh, in order for this event to, to take place and to be possible. Uh, so please raise your hand if, if, I, if I name you so people can clap. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Congratulations to all those celebrating birthdays or anniversaries <laughs> on these days at the weekend. Um, so also as part of this speaking series, we will have an event on 8th, on April 20th, you're all invited as well as one on immigration into the Washington DC region on April 27 and 28. So if you register for this, you'll probably get the emails and follow us for those events. All right, so let's move now to uh, Dr. Shapiro. Um, normally here one would read uh, her bio and her accomplishments and Madison provided that. Uh, but instead of that, I will, tell, I will let her tell you about herself. Uh, as she does beautifully in her book, which I recommend to all of you is very, very well written. Uh, she will be selling uh, some copies at the end and a table on the back and signing them if you desire at a, a very nice price. Thank you to uh, the Mandel Villar Press. And um, instead of telling you about her and, and just before she starts, uh, let me mention uh, the concept of the sociological imagination, which is a, a term used by Secret Mills to talk about how history and biography all, all, always meet. And this is something that happens to all of us but sometimes we confuse choice and circumstance, fate and luck with historical forces that shape our lives. The COVID pandemic made us realize how futile it is sometimes to plan into the future because things happen that are beyond our control. Um, but what uh, Dr. Shapiro does in her book, besides uh, humanizing a, a population and herself, it also it's a beautiful illustration about how history shapes uh, a biography. Uh, so it's something that makes crystal clear how the events around us shape our lives. So without further ado, I'll introduce you to Dr. Alan Shapiro. Thank you. Good afternoon. Everybody can you hear me well without microphone? It's all good. Okay. And uh, I'm really honored and proud to be invited by American University to talk uh, about the book, which is a memoir. And uh, this is a cover slide and the memoir is, I put uh, three parts of what is the book about. And uh, on the first one next to the cover, you, um, I don't, want to test you what is you think it is, not because you will fail, because everybody failed that, but just because we don't have time. It looks like Mars rover exploration, but what is it for real? This is the um, cover of the unit of the reactor number four that exploded in Chernobyl in April of 1986. The cover of the building was made with the holes and it was a part of the well thought design to let the winds to to give the 
opportunity of the ventilation, but nobody thought at that time that this false design will also let radioactive particles to disperse into the atmosphere. The next part of my book is called uh, Stateless uh, Refugee. And uh, I just wanted to show that although it was a diverse group of uh, population, that everyone's stories were personal and unique, but at the same time, many stories united us and shared by the all refugees, and I will get to that. And on the bottom, the third part, which is uh, called radiation expert, I dedicated 23 years of my life in the United States, working for the Food and Drug Administration, Office of Counterterrorism and Emergency Coordination. And it always a stopper of any conversation when people ask me, oh, you're a doctor, what do you do? And I'm with the Office of Counterterrorism. What? Said, no, not terrorism, counterterrorism. <laughs> and uh, the mission of our office was and is to help pharmaceutical companies and uh, private investigators to develop drugs against radiation exposure, against uh, chemical threats, and against the biological threats. And uh, that's what I was doing uh, at that office uh, because my background related to some, some radiation events. So this is so-called strategic national stockpile. And this is a part of the federal uh, of the government property, which has all the medical supply, not just drugs. It has uh, IVs, things, and everything that needed for any of the ready of any of the disaster and headquarters or quarters of this strategic national stockpile are strategically located in the different parts of the United States. I don't know, nobody knows. Well, some people, of course, know where they are. I don't. But the idea <laughs> if any of the disaster hit, then, of course, what people have on hand at the hospitals, the supply will run out very quickly if hundreds of thousands of people get affected. So strategic, the quarters located the way that each area that was hit or, or any needed population will receive any needed supply within 24 hours. And uh, now I will just quickly tell you why I decided to write this book. And there are several reasons. One of the motivation was to share with the reader untold stories about Chernobyl disaster that hit Ukraine and the entire world in 1986. And I was one of the first physician responders to the disaster and I wanted to share the stories that never been told before. And uh, some of the chronicle that I will tell you about, it's, uh, it's uh, the mistakes that were made at Chernobyl. There was no government plan and no plan, no proper response. And today it sounds very, very obvious, but at that time people did not realize it. And for many years, when I was attending international meetings, I, will, I was asked the same questions. What were the first medical responders least prepared for? And my answer never changed. I always said everything, which is, which is absolutely true. The second motivation, excuse me, was to share my family and other families' harrowing journey of immigration from the former Soviet Union to the United States as stateless refugees. On this journey, we all faced the great unknowns as all those people who displaced to different political or cultural environments. And uh, each family, for each family, including my immigration, uh, uh, projected or presented 
a mixed bag. For some people, it was just joy and good events. You know, stay in Italy for a couple of months uh, was okay. But for many people, it was just the worst experience, including my family. And uh, this made me feel strongly that the stories of hardship and losses and victories and hopes should not be forgotten because new generation immigration probably will or migration will never stop and uh, i just wanted to share those stories and the third reason to write the book was to convey to the reader meaningful and some unique job that i did in the united states and i already mentioned this uh, to you Okay, so in the next, I think, remaining 30 minutes, I'm going to take you on a journey that started for me 36 years ago. I first heard from Chernobyl disaster from my dad, who called me on that day or early morning on April 26, 1986, with the dire news that at 1.23, at night, um, the core of the nuclear reactor had exploded in Prepeg. For many years, my dad was getting all the news of what was going on in the Soviet Union, either from Voice of America or BBC, because he didn't trust uh, the news what was uh, in the Soviet Union. So he called me on Saturday, five in the morning, telling me what happened. And I was, of course, not very happy to be awake at 5 a.m. Um, on Saturday. And uh, I did not really, I was not really concerned first about what happened because I never heard of Pripyat. I never knew that the nuclear, the largest nuclear reactor was there. Although we lived uh, 80, 60 miles, Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, city of over 2 million people were, still located there, but I never heard about that. But my dad listened to BBC at five in the morning, and this was the only time when we were able to receive unjammed broadcasts because these uh, mute uh, things were close to our house. And so this was the only time. So as I mentioned, Prepet is in a small city located 60 miles from uh, Kiev. And the largest city, the closest to Prepet is Chernobyl. It's only nine miles different, nine miles distance. That's why the worst nuclear accident in history is called Chernobyl accident. Chernobyl accident was a result of the flawed design and I, pointed out just one piece of it with the little holes for venting and also loss of human errors. The untrained or poorly trained personnel was responsible from the beginning and uh, really didn't know what to do when the disaster occurred. Um, the world, this happened at 1.23 a.m. and the world was still unaware that particles were catapulted as a rocket through the atmosphere and uh, went across the west part of Europe and northern hemisphere. So on this slide, I want to show you the city of Prepet, where not, again, living very close, I did not hear about Prepet. It was designed in 1970 as a model of Soviet metropolis. This, uh, the government, the authorities were telling people all the time, this city is built just for you. And city was housing only people who worked at the nuclear power station and uh, their families. And uh, residents really, saw their city as a heaven. I never seen in Kiev the building so modern as they were in Prepet. And behind those buildings, there were rivers for fishing, woods for picking up 
berries and uh, mushrooms. And uh, the picture was completed by abundance of fruit trees that were all along the city. And of course, this heaven and earth was abruptly um, fell apart when two days after the city, the whole population, 50,000 people were evacuated from Pripyat and city was placed on the list of uh, the ghost towns, ghost towns. So after the explosion, uh, the Soviet and Ukrainian governments provide issued no warnings and <clears throat> completely uh, and uh, proceeded with one idea that life is as usual. And again, in capital of Ukraine or any other cities, we did not hear any official information. Rumors, lots of people had their relatives or friends in the United States, in Europe. So they were calling them, telling what happened and nobody knew what happened. But um, the reactor was burning the core of the reactor was burning for two weeks. And one of the attempts to change the fire was to send the pilots, the helicopter pilots, to drop into the core of the reactor lead and clay and dolomite to put out the fire. The crew of the helicopter pilots consisted of pilots who just returned from Afghanistan. And it was uh, very, well, smart, of course, in bad way calculation of the Soviet government. They thought, the authorities thought that people who never fought in the war, the pilots who never fought in the war, <laughs> would be afraid to fly in the clouds of radioactive uh, elements. So they decided to engage to recruit pilots who just came from Afghanistan. And Afghanistan was invaded by Soviets in 1979. So the government saw that people who, as they said, already look death in the eyes would be the right <clears throat> people to do the job. And uh, the helicopter pilots who came from Afghanistan, again, they didn't know where they're going. They were told that they're going on vacation, but then landed in um, Kiev and sent from there to Pripyat. So each helicopter pilot received the experimental drug against medication, I'm sorry, against radiation. The name of the drug was Indralin. You don't have to remember, although now it's available on eBay, online, Russians are selling this drug for very low prices. So the drug, unfortunately, had lots of side effects such as nausea, vomiting, and dramatic drop in the blood pressure, which was, was not good for anybody, especially helicopter pilots. And in addition, it didn't stay alive of any. So cameramen and uh, helicopter pilots who were flying about the reactor, they all died of acute radiation syndrome. Two of them were sent to Seattle. They all stayed in Moscow or in Kiev. They, clinics, uh, hospitals, but two of them were in Seattle, but uh, they all, two of them died. died. While uh, that was going on in the sky, the most, uh, even more horrific and called as a suicide attempt was uh, going on on the reactor roof. This is a roof of the exploded reactor four, unit four, and there were lots of radioactive debris on the roof and uh, they had to be removed. And the first step that was uh, attempted, uh, the robots that were given as a gift from Japan they were placed on the 
top of the roof of the reactor roof and uh, they were navigated to pick up uh, the debris. But in a couple of days, all robots turned into the pride particles because of the levels of radiation. And when it happened, people were assigned to this job. They all were volunteers and um, everybody received 2,000 rubles, which is $35, to stay on the reactor roof for 90 seconds. And the order was you stay, you count while you're there, you pick up, yes, you have gloves, that's it. You pick up this heavy radioactive debris and you count till 90. When you say to yourself, it's 90, you drop everything where you stay and you run, run away. And then new people, new shift will come and do this. So people who were on the roof, they did not have the zimeters, the device to measure radiation. They did not know the levels of radiation. Their dosimeters the were confiscated by the government with the one goal just to cover the truth and to cover the the level of this. Uh, deadly exposure. <laughs> so this is the map that uh, was put together by scientists illegally. Again, we've heard all the rumors and people were thinking, where can they take their kids, especially kids, because adults had to work for uh, to evacuate to a safe place. But we didn't know. And I want to say this was probably like day five, six after. And I already was as a team leader for the first responders, but I didn't know any of these areas, which area is bad. And uh, I was sent to the one that it says Narodich, this is angry red co uh, color on the bottom of the, of the map. So luckily uh, I had a neighbor in the apartment building where we lived who the PhD in physics and worked at the um, Institute of Physics. So he and his colleagues put together the real map that would reflect all the contaminated area that in bright or angry red and uh, less contaminated in pink. So they smuggled, and again, everything was illegal. We are not supposed to know the truth. So my neighbor smuggled this map from his work came to our apartment and said, I have to show, to share with you something, just let's call our very close friends and we'll keep it secret. So we called a few friends and uh, watching lots of spy movies in the Soviet Union, we were well aware, again, maybe it's not true, but that's how I grew up. If you want to, if you don't want anyone to hear or not anyone, KGB, for example, conversation in your house, you disconnect the landlines and nobody will hear you. And also you drop the blinds or uh, and then nobody will see you. So that's exactly what we did. Disconnect the lines, drop the blinds, and we hover over this, over this map and immediately realize that Kiev is one of the really, really worst uh, places. Um, and uh, so the next step was evacuation. Where can we take our daughter in my case? And it pertains to all other families who heard the rumors, but unfortunately did not see the, the real map. Where do we take our children? And we were lucky that the city where now, unfortunately, is the most dangerous is Kharkiv. You heard now probably how this city is most dangerous during this uh, ongoing war. At that time was the best city in Ukraine. It's really because the plume of radiation and winds and rain just passed. It goes like patches and uh, it depends on the weather. 
uh, that Kharkiv was absolutely clean. And uh, one of our relatives lived there and she offered that we can send our daughter who was three years old at the time with her grandmothers to stay with her indefinitely. But there was no way to find tickets, neither to fly, no to the train. Tickets were sold out even on the black market. Lots of the tickets somehow got to the black market and people started uh, buying them. So it took us 10 days to get tickets to evacuate, to go and uh, to the train and uh, send our daughter to the place. And this is a picture how it looked um, at that time. And my parents and grandparents who went through the World War II told me that this is what reminded them the vacation during the World War II. Is it what I think Echo and Ernesto, that how history repeats itself, that exactly what my parents went through in 1942 when Kiev was occupied by Germans and they had to evacuate their family. So the train was waiting for the platform and usually there is a very strict check of the tickets. You have to show your tickets and you proceed to your seat in any of the wagons that designated on your on your ticket and that how it's like everywhere but on that day this rule did not exist all the windows all the doors stayed open and parents who could not get tickets from anywhere to send their child to the safe place were handing children through the open windows, through the doors, begging strangers to take their child to the safe location. And I was there and it was, it was absolutely devastating and impossible to watch. And it always, you know, be in my memory, the devastation and uh, looking at other parents. So some um, very uh, wonderful people, strangers, took children and they took them to the location where they went with their children. However, there was a myth, and I want to emphasize it, it, although it's not a medical audience, this is very important to know that people who came from the contaminated areas they are not dangerous. They cannot give you the radiation. But at the, if, again, they change the clothes, if you take off your clothes, it will take away 90% of radiation. I'm talking radiation that on the surface, not the one that really high doses you inhale or uh, just like X-ray, gamma rays will go deep in your body. People who came from contaminated area, if they change their clothes and take a shower, it takes away 100% of radiation. So they cannot be, they're not dangerous. But at that time, and now even today, there is myth that I'm always trying to, you know, to prepare people that I talk to that you, you should not be afraid of that because this could happen anytime anywhere and people who were kids who came to different uh, locations like summer camps lots of places refused to accept them they called them dirty and uh, this was the, the nickname for those children and for weeks parents who handed their children to others you know, without telephone without cell phones internet ipads Parents for two, three weeks did not know where their children were. And the same experience was with children who were evacuated to Moscow. There was a movement, let's send our children to Moscow. It's a clean, it's relative, oh, we have more water, right? Mm -hmm. No, I'm going to... So the same experience, thank you, children in Moscow. 
So they arrived to the capital of the Soviet Union, families who were supposed to take the children said no to every single child. The same reason they thought the children are contaminated and they don't want to keep them. Am I okay with time? Just give me a warning, like 10 minutes. So for many years, scientists and doctors were focusing their attention on the late effects of radiation, only thinking about uh, cancers. And psychological effects were never mentioned. In 2005, I attended this meeting in Geneva, WHO, and the first we went into the audience, walked in, and this was the introductory statement on every single wall. I don't know why, but this is for the first time I was in the US, was uh, already for you know, 10 years, yeah? and uh, doing work in radiation, and I was not aware about psychological effects of radiation because I was focusing on cancer. I am a pediatric oncologist by training, so this was the area that I was interested. But now we know very well that uh, the main psychological consequence, the main uh, trauma were not cancers, were not cardiovascular diseases, were psychological effects of Chernobyl. And the main were anxiety and depression and suicide. And we know this very well now that this is the worst and the, the worst consequences. And of course, this, if we knew about that, or this could have been not maybe avoided, but could have been diminished. But again, nobody knew about that. And now there are totally different change in assessment of effects of Chernobyl. And knowing these lessons, we try to implement it into any disaster. What we know now that disasters, they will happen. We don't know when. And the approach should be different from what it was. Just a few words again for the safety of time. The main attention. First of all, people should be together. We cannot be isolated in terms of not asking for help. In my country, to ask for help, it was a bad sign that you are a wimp, you are a weak person, and uh, it's not good. But it's, it's a wrong approach, and we need to be together during the disaster, and particularly special attention should be paid to vulnerable people. And again, now it's one of the most prominent um, venues that uh, scientists are studying and promoting, that uh, there is no such thing as disaster amnesia. Lots of people try to forget about the disaster, and this is wrong. And the main attention should be paid to and on the vulnerable population, children, pregnant women, people with different concomitant diseases, <laughs> and uh, elderly people. So these people require most of the attention, not only during the disaster, but years after. Well, I hope this will be your favorite. <laughs> it's not the last one, though. So uh, as a uh, I was uh, taking care of pediatric patients. The hospitals for adults were overwhelmed with adult patients who were brought from Chernobyl station. They all were operators, not for firefighters with severe burns were flown to Moscow. People who required bone marrow transplant 
with uh, CVRQ radiation syndrome were at the ICUs, but adult hospitals were filled with adults, and there was not enough uh, not enough internal medicine doctors. So they started recruiting pediatricians to see adults, and I was one of them. And by the time uh, of Chernobyl, I already spent all my life with uh, pediatric patients, and I forgot really didn't know how to approach adults. And it's it's a very different job. You know, with the kids, you start telling the kids story about, you know, three little piglets and it is yours, trust you. With the adults, I really didn't know what to do, but I had to. So I walked into the room where at the hospital, eight adult patients were in one room. And, you know, they all look sad and uh, nobody paid any attention. I walked in. But one, uh, and I was there not knowing where to begin, and then one patient was waving me with the, some papers. So it looked like an inviting gesture. So I approached um, him and, uh, again, not didn't know how to start the conversation. I recall from some cheat sheet when I was a resident, you asked, what's your complaints? And I asked, the man, what's your complaints? And he said, what are you talking, girl, about what complaints? I am grateful to ambulance that brought me here. What complaints are you talking about? So this was a first failure. And then, uh, so he forgot it immediately and then uh, showed me this paper. Said, this is our manual. He was a worker from uh, Chernobyl station, one of the operators. And he said, this is our manual. And our manual says, we need to know it by heart, every worker. And uh, one of the points says that if something occurred, disaster, you have to drink red wine. And I thought that he joking. And he said, what do you mean? Can you show it to me, please? He said, I cannot, because after the react after the explosion we were told by our superiors our bosses to take this uh, page out it's not there so this was uh, interesting conversation and i uh, didn't feel you know very confident that he is not telling me the truth but i didn't know how to check it so i got home i mobilized three generations of my family, and we are going to the grocery store, we'll buy red wine. So we're all there at the grocery store. Well, this is an opposite picture just to, so you remember this, the shelves were empty. There were not a single bottle of the red wine. And me, first responder, had no idea that red wine, not vodka, not white wine, not beer, protects from radiation and past so rumors already spread faster than radiation that people bought all the red wine all there was no supply but fast forward uh, currently the team of scientists from Penn University is working on the drug which name is resveratrol again you don't have to remember but it's an official name it has not been approved it's under the investigation did not come to the FDA yet, but this drug is made from out of uh, red uh, grapes. So red wine come from, comes from red grapes. So the team, and this is a particular uh, name of this substance, resveratrol. So scientists decided to put it in the drug. And when I talked to one of these uh, of the guys who in charge of that, I asked, I, I was at the FDA at the time. I said, what happened uh, if your drug does not get approved? Can we drink red wine? And he said, yeah, one person has to consume 720 bottles of red wine to get the desirable dose. And you understand. <laughs> After 720 bottles, you don't care about anything, not <laughs> radiation, not at all. 
Okay, now we are in Italy. Uh, as a state with refugees, our family and all families went to Austria first. This was the only way to get to the United States. And then again, status refugees to Italy. And uh, I have to be honest with you, but those days in Italy were not Roman holidays. Mm -hmm. My family of seven, and I call four generations, and I call them Magnificent Seven. The oldest was my grandmother, who was 84. The youngest was my daughter, who was six years old at the time. So seven of us were just uh, um, not knowing whether we ever get to the United States. Families uh, were receiving the rejection from the US government at that time more and more. Before in early 80s, each family did not have to prove that they fit the um, status of refugees. It was it was uh, given if you are Jewish family and you're immigrating, you want to immigrate, you have all the rights to be called this refugee. But then rule change, and uh, we only found out why six to 8,000 refugees were stuck in Italy in 1988 and 1989. And the reason that United States did not expect so many refugees from the former Soviet Union, and there were no um, no resources to 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 keep them well alive and uh, provide uh, help. I didn't mention that uh, each of us, not saying that we didn't have any papers at all, each refugee was allowed to have uh, sixty ninety dollars per person and 40 pounds belonging. That was it, that how, how we, we left. So um, this slide, again, I go very briefly. If you want more details, everything is in the book. This is how, this is just a taste, I call it a taste of Italy. The Soviet refugees were without any income in Italy. Nobody worked, we did not write to work. So this was to the left, this is the apartment uh, where we lived. Seven of us, there was no door. It looked like a train, no doors, no windows, uh, just drapes. And uh, each conversation was very, very open. Everybody knew exactly who is who in this family when you talk loudly. The second one, you see Kahiba cigars. People, uh, there was at that time, it doesn't exist not, neither before nor after, so-called Americana market. And this was in the suburbs of Rome. So lots of people brought from their countries some goods to sell at this Americana market to Italians or whoever were tourists there. And the most popular were these Cahiba cigars, which in Moscow, look how they break. They are uh, in this uh, silver paper. Each one uh, looked like a rocket ready to launch. They look beautiful. In addition, there was a rumor that Fidel Castro at that time, US did not have relations with Cuba. And uh, it was a history that uh, lots of presidents of America love Cuban cigars, but now there is no taste of such, so let's buy them on Americano. Each cigar in Moscow cost uh, two rubles, which less than, I don't know, maybe 15 cents, but people without MD, without PhD in math realize that, an Americano, they can sell them for $20 per one. And that's what they did. This is a picture also, it's kind of funny. Uh, I wrote the chapter about the doctors that I met here, we were studying together. She is also from Kiev, worked as a physician in Kiev. 
she's in Italy with two daughters, no income whatsoever. So she tried to become, to get some money by becoming a waitress. So she went to the restaurant, beautiful restaurant and uh, held by fam, owned by family. And she said to the owner that she would like to, wait, to work as a waitress there. And he asked her, did you work as a waitress before? And she said, yeah, I did it in Kiev for 10 years. So he hired her, but was little suspicious and watched each move, what she was doing at the restaurant. But luckily, the family of the owner were very nice people. They were collecting the orders from the from people and put it on my friend's plate, serving plate. And uh, it lasted for a couple of hours. And then it was some hot meals. So she came to the table where the customers were sitting and dropped this all in front of them. So of course, this all went into the air, soup or whatever. And the rest was like in the movie. The owner who was watching her from the back ran up to her and said, you are fired. So she was, but first he asked, what did you do? She said, that's what we did in Kiev. <laughs> and he said, but there is a little table here right in front of you, this is for you to put all your, to put the tray and then gradually slowly pass the dishes. So now she is a doctor in Texas and uh, so everything turned well. Okay, last, my favorite. This is how we all try to get some ride to the places we need. We didn't have money even to get on the bus. And if uh, you have to go somewhere to get food, the, the only thing, no sightseeing, you have to do hitchhiking. And there was developed so-called hitchhiker's guide, which worked very well. And uh, usually uh, the, the blonde with her daughter did the best, then the second the blonde with her older sister, not so good, and then mother, grandmother, <laughs> not good at all. So the idea was the young lady uh, will just stay on the road, preferably where the bushes are, because all her family, fathers, grandfathers, husbands, were hiding in the bushes. And she's on the road with this, it's not me, it's my friend. <laughs> and make this pathetic movement and the car stops and the driver opens the door, Craig a senora, and senora says, everybody said, Viva Italia. And the driver said, yeah, where do you wanna go? The lady will tell where she wants to go. And then she makes this inviting station of her family with father, grandfather, to get to the back of the car. Okay, I'm done. Done with the time. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, Ella, for the presentation. Remaining slides, <laughs> please let me know. No, so, so thank you. So that was kind of the, the, the PowerPoint, but we'll have a conversation and then we'll have a QA. And I know there's a lot that uh, couldn't be covered in the PowerPoint in an hour or so. That's what I recommend you to buy the book afterwards. But I'm gonna follow up. I'm gonna start off with a few questions to fill in some of the gaps, and then we'll open up, up to the audience for you to ask your questions. Uh, so Alan, you were talking uh, powerfully about the uh, accident in Chernobyl, and then you take us to Italy when you were uh, uh, waiting for to getting permission to come to America as a refugee, and how the policy changed, and then because of the Jewish Americans pressure in the government, they were able to then uh, force uh, uh, the US to take a big chunk of the people in Italy uh, escaping. But in between that, uh, you show in the book time and time again, how you were a bright student, hardworking doctor, uh, getting invited by professors to do research, getting promoted. And then because of your religion, uh, the government wouldn't approve it and will stop your career. So uh, that's when the, so the question I have is about migration, because uh, you read in the book that you decided and your family decided to leave. 
in the USSR. The USSR at that time allows them to leave, but it's a very denigrating process. They have to go in line. The, before they leave in the country, the, the government will take their passports and give them a little piece of newspaper and making them factually and symbolically stateless people. That's what she says. She didn't have a state for a while. In, in Italy, she was in limbo. And the Italians soon were like, Russians leave. You have this xenophobia. And then she also spends with her family some time in Austria and also is not the, the, the immigration person is very excluding. Uh, so then you talk about how in the airport, the Austrian or the Italian people were very not welcoming, but then you talk about America being welcoming and how that was a good start to your life here. And you talk about integrating here. So I wonder if you can tell a bit more about that decision to migrate, which I will say you were forced by discrimination or issues to choose to leave. And then uh, whether uh, America has been welcoming beyond the agent in the airport and whether you have faced similar situations in America for your identity as a woman, as a Jewish person, uh, as an immigrant, you had to go to medical school again, go to Georgetown. So anyway, where you have found similar uh, discrimination procedures in America and, and kind of how, what the role of, of the welcoming city, the welcoming policies, the fact that they, I think somebody from the government, when you came here, welcomed you in the airport. So if you can tell a bit of the audience, that experience, experience they grew up in from the book about being an immigrant and arriving here. Okay. Yeah, of course. I'll be very honest. So when we landed in uh, Austria, there was no welcoming uh, from the part of the gentlemen or the part of the team that met us at the airport in Oz, in Vienna. The whole airplane that uh, departed from Kiev was 90% of uh, immigrants or refugees. And when we landed, uh, this man uh, really didn't welcome us. He said, who are you guys? Are you here looking for uh, for healthy, for wealthy life? This was his greeting. Well, we ignored that. And then in Italy, the population was very welcoming. We didn't, uh, with the government, we really did not give the interview that after we received the letters that our family received the rejection was with the American consulate, not with Italians. But Italians were very welcoming. They uh, really were amazing in treating our children and organizing uh, some little performances in theaters. And then around Christmas time, there were are throwing, this is a tradition there, they're throwing their loss of their um, belongings, uh, even little pieces of furniture out of the windows, which symbolize we finish the year, we close this chapter, everything will be new, but we didn't know about that. We thought that they are throwing this to us. And uh, there were lots of people segregating, or uh, aggregating uh, on the grounds to catch this, uh, things. And in the US, when my family arrived, we didn't know anybody. And two people from the synagogue, the one on Old Georgetown Road, well, the whole synagogue adopted our family. And uh, two people met us, two strangers met us at the airport and uh, greeted and took us to our first residence in Rockville, where all my family lived for two years. And when we were passing through the border control, of course, we look different from other population. And uh, the African-American lady who was there, she said, welcome home, guys. And this was a really, you know, warm, really warm, and I will never forget it. And uh, people who were American that we never met them before, they provided enormous help to us. The one lady also from synagogue, again, the first connection was with the synagogue and every member of that family wanted to help. So one lady was coming and we didn't have a car. So was coming, picking us up, taking to different uh, interviews. And anytime I said to her, thank you, thank you very much. One day she responded, don't thank me because I am happy that I am helping you, not you are helping me. So 
it was interesting. So it's our, you know, she was of course very happy that uh, she is she was born in the United States and. Uh, her life is different. So with uh, some of them, of those people, after 32 years staying in the U.S., we are still, they're still our best friends. And, you know, one person who is, who I never also met before, hired me to work at the dental, uh, not assistant, of course, because I didn't have any training in dentistry at his uh, office. And he asked, uh, if you have to go to the interview, do you have a car? I said, no, but how are you going to go? And I said, I don't know. I didn't think about it. He said, okay, tomorrow let's meet downstairs in front of uh, his Barlow building on Wisconsin Avenue. Let's meet there. So I'm there and he's with his uh, Cadillac, not his, his mother. And he said, this is car for you, just use it. He didn't even ask if I have a permit, you know, license. No, this is the car for you, just use it. Yeah, so this is how American community welcomed us. So the book is felt of uh, heartwarming uh, periods like that, examples of empathy. And what the book is really good at doing um, is at humanizing Allah and, and her family. And that's something that the USSR, uh, the, the people in your family that fought the Nazis, were trying for a long time to decimate this population. So, so I just wanted to say that your, your book succeeds in not letting them, not letting them win. And, and we recognize your humanity, obviously, here today and the readers of your book. So you are I'm, a survivor. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't answer the very important question, whether I ever experienced in the United States any no discrimination. And again, I'm honest as I can be not a single time in all my career or all my life, I ever, ever experience any discrimination because of being Jewish or because of being a woman, never, ever. And um, yeah, I tell this to my daughter who is now an adult and um, I, I'm telling this to everyone. Thank you. So you are a, a survivor uh, of anti-Semitism, of exile, of radiation. You start writing the book when you're receiving chemo. You have cancer. After going back for many years, maybe 30 years, you go back to, to um, Ukraine for a conference on radiation. And then you start feeling sick and you realize that you have cancer. And as a way to make the hours pass, you start writing the book. Um, and, and you're here with us today. So 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 it is it is fantastic. Um, because um so that's when history meets biography, but also the way you take and I guess some luck makes a difference. Because also what Allah does in the book, she tells some stories about people in Italy, people that escape, people after the radiation, uh, people with PhDs, smart scientists who uh, become alcoholic, uh, commit suicide. So you've seen a lot of people that, that were not as lucky. Um, so we also want to thank you for for sharing the the bright and the and the dark. And if you want to share anything about that uh, that struggle that you have uh, been successful, at. you were talking about how you were working at the, at the FDA and you're working helping America prepare for catastrophes and for terrorist attacks and 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 be prepared. So, so my last question. So you can mention about that if you want. Or that will be my last question. If um, in the book you also say what the secrecy of the USSR to Chernobyl, uh, the cover up, um, the myths, how you saw some of that reappear during the COVID pandemic, and even though you and your your staff and, and people, the colleagues, were telling the government to prepare stockpiles, and that wasn't the case, and it wasn't ready when COVID happened here. So, what do you want to share a little bit with the audience about those uh, takeaways that you read about in the book? Yeah, the COVID chapter I added at the very end. I was not planning on writing anything about COVID because it's not my field. But when the publisher asked me, you have to write two, three chapters about COVID when everything, the manuscript was completed. You no, know, one of my 
rules of life, don't argue with uh, your son-in-law and don't argue with the publisher. And I carry this. So I added three chapters about COVID. There are lots of similarities, unfortunately, between Chernobyl disaster and COVID. But what I would like to emphasize that in my professional life, I attended numerous meetings for preparedness and strategic national stockpile situation and status, but they all were related to radiation. I never was involved in anything what's related to COVID. And I was utterly surprised when uh, I've heard this uh, true information that there is no masks, there is no, it's not what, again, what you need for radiation. It's very different supply, but it's still the same you no know, government entity. And also they cover up that uh, disaster will go away. This is what I mentioned before. Disaster amnesia is not helping people at all. People need to be prepared, be together. And the information should come. Again, this is a similarity that information should come from medical regarding the health um, issues should come from the professional, from medical uh, doctors or nurses, medical personnel, not from politicians. And this is what happened in Chernobyl and we saw it uh, for a long time, unfortunately, with COVID. So it showed a very, very high level of unpreparedness and what is obvious, no preparedness, no proper response. Thank you, doctor. Any questions from the audience? Any follow-ups? What do you think about your first question? Let me just read two paragraphs from the book about COVID. Uh, uh, Alag writes, in 1986, the Soviet Union mishandled the Chernobyl nuclear expulsion explosion, in part because that country did not, did not know how to prepare for such a disaster. In contrast, the U.S. knew how to prepare for a pandemic, but did not do it. Though President Trump insisted that the Obama administration left him with a bare cupboard, it is apparent that many failures occurred under his watch. Calls for action during the hearings and legislation in 2018 and 2019 were not heeded, nor were measures taken to rectify the problems revealed by the, 19, the, by the 2019 Crimson Contagion exercise. He was simulated a, a pandemic coming from China. Uh, and then last paragraph, here is my prescription for change in our country, to improve the governmental transparency and government oversight, to institute discrete budgeting for disaster preparedness, to improve government agency coordination, to partner with other nations on disaster preparedness efforts, and to restate the US membership in the World Health Organization and other international disaster preparedness groups. Thank you, uh, which has a lot to do with our Changing Aid uh, initiative, by the way. Uh, questions from the audience. Please, sir. Has there been a, a lot of? It's okay. Thank you. Have there been a lot of um, improvements in America in our preparedness for a nuclear disaster um, since uh, Three Mile Island and what happened in Chernobyl? And could you just talk about a few of them, if there have been? Yeah, I did not attend any single table, so-called tabletop exercise in Soviet Union, but I attended every year or sometimes twice a year, so-called tabletop exercises when uh, real uh, CNN anchor or other station anchor in the room on the screen and uh, all people who participate in, in the room. And he's telling us that the atomic 10 nuclear power bomb was dropped, let's say Chicago, not in Washington. But by the way, what government, the main uh, government planning is uh, the um, drop of the nuclear power, nuclear bomb of 10 kiloton in one of the largest cities in Washington among them, Washington, Seattle, New York. So I participated in those exercises where they said the, the drop of the bomb in Chicago, what do we do? And then someone who is in charge 
pushes and screens are all over the room. There is no wall, just screens like that. Pushes uh, the one of the screens and it shows how many empty beds in that particular area at this moment. Then pushes different, the same screen, but just different spot. How many doctors, how many nurses on leave on that particular day in that area? So this was uh, very impressive to me. And then how we triage people, this is also one of the most important part of the response because unfortunately people who would be in the epicenter, they will not survive. Then there are three different uh, like circles, but again, this is for professionals. So professionals, I think are again for radiation preparedness, I cannot talk about anything else, are much better prepared. Of course, there is no flawless uh, ways or guidance rather how to deal with the disaster, but we really do hear everything that we possibly can. Any other questions? Please. Could you describe could you describe a little bit more the uh, anti-Semitism that you felt in the Soviet Union, please? Yeah, I can. How many hours I have? Just, <laughs> just tell me. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, not only me. All my family had this history. My mom was the leading uh, professor in medicine in one of the clinics, in one of the hospitals. She never was able to go to any of the international meetings because of her last name. And uh, when I was, okay, so this is my mom's and my grandfather also was uh, put in jail. He was at some point uh, the, chief engineer at one of the factories and uh, he was put in jail when he was 56 years old and the accusation was that he is hiring too many Jews to work so he was in jail he had his cardiac um, myocardial infarct uh, cardia Thank you. There and uh, then he was out of the prison and he died of another attack, heart attack when he was 62 years old after prison. He was going back to his office and uh, so all accusations were, of course, uh, dismissed. And uh, with me, I was okay in kindergarten, I guess. But and maybe school as well. But when I was a first year medical student, the dean told that if and there was 10 of us in maybe 10 groups, so total of 100 people. And the dean, before the semester started, he said that if there would be a group, the best all A's on at the end of the semester, this uh, group of students will be granted a trip to Poland, not to Mars, to Poland. And since we were unable to go to any of the foreign countries, then Poland was just wonderful, sound wonderful. And it just happened that the group where I was uh, one the whole thing and we were, everybody was you know, chanting and happy that our group is going to Poland and uh, the following day, no announcement. And then Dean finally openly said, no, your group is not going because we cannot send the person with the Jewish, with the last name Jewish. So I went to Poland 30 years after, but it's a, uh, different story yeah so this is uh, and there are so many of such examples but uh, so the last if i have to share with with the i think most impressive then after the chernobyl my obsession was that i want to do something forget about oncology i want to 
to something to help people survive radiation. And the big institute was opened in Kyiv. It's still there, Institute of Radiobiology. And my supervisor, professor, was nominated the, as the director of this institute. And he was uh, told to take three people from the hospital where he worked, uh, who already had, there were three requirements, uh, age 30, not older than 36, I believe, and with PhD. And at that time I fit both criteria. So he told me that he would like to take me with him and two other people, but just keep it as a secret. Nobody should know. So I kept it as a secret and days and months passed and I didn't hear anything. So finally I confronted him and said, am I, and he already left. And I, but he was also coming back and forth because our pediatric uh, hospital did not have a supervisor at that time. So he was serving both. And then uh, he told me, you know, I have to tell you, but never tell this anybody, but, you know, stature limitation gone so I can share now. And um, so he told me that he had to run all the candidates through the uh, Minister of Health. And he came to the Minister of Health uh, and told him that he'll take three people with him. And uh, the minister asked who, I, who is going with you. And he mentioned to my to all my colleagues, uh, one was the uh, daughter of KGB colonel and another also had good background. And then uh, he said, Shapira, and the minister asked, and what is this? Not even who is this? He said, what is this? And my boss said, well, it's one of my, my good doctors. And the minister said, no, with such last name, nobody goes to that uh, Institute of Radiobiology. So this was the last, real last straw. I started crying. I came home and said, yes, we're leaving. So this was... Last question, please. So I appreciate your willingness to talk about the anti-Semitism you've experienced, um, but I'm curious as a Jewish person, um, how your uh, beliefs or practices or observances have uh, changed throughout your lifetime and what parts of your Judaism have informed your story? Yeah, uh, before we came to the United States, I didn't know anything at all. I knew that I am Jewish, but that was it. All holidays, celebration of holidays was forbidden. There were two synagogues in Kiev, and both were transformed. One was transformed into the Pipe Theater, and another one was just uh, hardly functioning. And if anyone with, you know, that uh, it always was under surveillance. If someone who just appeared in the vicinity of the synagogue, not even walking in, and the age of this person looks like person is, wor is working, not a child, not old grandmother, then the KGB guy who is watching everybody would come to you and ask, show me your uh, ID, tell me where you're working, what's your uh, boss phone number, and you either, most likely you will lose your job. Yeah, so it's very different what I was, I am still facing here. And uh, my uh, daughter is uh, really into Judaism and I have four grandsons and the oldest one just had his bar mitzvah three days ago. So it's, it's very different. Indeed. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Ella, 
for sharing with us, for writing this wonderful book. As I said before, she will be signing uh, copies on the back. There's a reception, there's coffee, there's cookies. So stick around, you can ask questions one-on-one, -on -one, uh, share with us. Um, so let me remind you that this event was sponsored in part by American University Signature Research Initiative, a program uh, from the Office of Research. It's uh, co sponsored by the School of International Service, the Immigration Lab uh, Changing Aid, which will have more talks on this series on April 20th and uh, as part of the annual Latino Public Affairs Forum on April 27 and 28. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you all so much for your interest, for listening to my stories. I really, really touch with your attention. And thank you. Thank you so much.